Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Tuesday to bring you another author interview. Hope you are doing well. I had a great weekend. I mean, the crazy thing about living in Europe is that you could travel around Europe. <laughs> I know that sounds stupid, but yeah, my husband and I took a road trip to Spain. That's not something you can do when you live in California. You can't just take a road trip to Spain. It was two hours and we were in Sevilla and we spent a beautiful weekend. Um, it was the, we just happened to get there, no planning on our part, but on the last night of the Flamenco Festival, we saw beautiful dancing, we met some incredible people, and then the next day we wandered around the square with the cathedral, and oh my gosh, it was just, it was beautiful. I could go on for a very long time, but i um, not going to, because that's not what you tuned in to listen to. just thought I would share that I had an amazing weekend, and I hope that you have also had an amazing weekend, no matter what it involved. Uh, it was 90 degrees in Spain on Sunday. It snowed at my sister's house for Mother's Day on Sunday. Mm, that was just a rude, rude Mother's Day present. That's what I have to say about that. But hopefully, if you celebrated Mother's Day, you had a lovely day as well. Um, or you celebrate your mother, or uh, I know it can be a hard day for some people, and hopefully you were surrounded by love regardless of the circumstances of the day. Uh, I want to make one comment about the last episode when I spoke with Joe Lee about his graphic novel, Forgiveness. At one point, I think I said it was historical fiction, and that is clearly incorrect. So I just want you to know that I do know that it's history, it's not historical fiction, that it is. Um, the story of a real woman who had a real life, and this was not fictionalized about her life. It was her story. So, uh, just just throwing that out there. Not historical fiction. Real story, non-fiction. <laughs> anyway, um, want to move on now to today's author interview. I'm speaking with author Robert Stephen Goldstein about his novel, Cat's Whisker. Uh, Cat's Whisker is the story of Samuel Barron, an engineer, inventor, and successful entrepreneur. Trained as a scientist, Barron never, nonetheless nurtures a lifelong fascination with mysticism and spirituality, investigating themes as varied and interesting as meditation, jujitsu, biology, anthropology, tai chi, BDSM, and the search for the perfect cocktail. His life is a quest, ultimately a successful one, for a view of the cosmos where science and spirituality don't just peacefully coexist, but are instead intimately bound up as co-equal aspect of an integrated and inspiring reality. So that is the description of Cat's Whisker by Robert Stephen Goldstein. And I mean, that packs a lot into just a few sentences, right? I mean, just the, 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 the themes of this main character explores it, from everything from jujitsu to BDSM is a, a quite the eye-catching statement right if that doesn't if that doesn't catch your catch your attention I don't know what will but this is a novel it is um, you know finding finding that that place where science and spirituality mesh because they aren't they are mutually exclusive. Um, you know, science is really science. They have, they have so many connections. I, I'm not, I'm not um, making full sentences right now, but they do have so many connections. And Robert really explores those connections and where they come together and how they aren't necessarily mutually exclusive, but that oftentimes spirituality and science are two sides of the same coin. Where science. Sometimes proves things that spirituality kind of knew in its gut all along, right? 
So it is. Uh, it's a novel, but it really does explore both sides of those of those those topics. Where where do we rely on science? When do we rely on spirituality? How do we manage to have them coexist within our beings, within um, the way we view the world, how we view the world, how we um, factor in events of the world or the things. Is it belief? Is it fact? Is it science? Is it spirituality? All those questions get asked and uh, attempted to be answered within this novel. So let's go ahead and turn to that interview with Robert so he can tell you more about the book and his inspiration for the story and the characters. Again, the novel is called Cat's Whisker. The author is Robert Stephen Goldstein. Hi, Robert. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. We um, are going to be discussing your novel, Cat's Whisker. Before we talk about the book, though, um, if you could share a little bit about yourself so my listeners can get to know you a little bit better, that would be wonderful. Okay. Uh, My name is Robert Stephen Goldstein. Uh, I'm the author of four novels. I live in San Francisco, and I've lived here for pretty much my entire adult life, but I grew up uh, back in New York City. Uh, I was a healthcare executive in information technology for a good number of years, but I retired early uh, at age 56 to become a writer. And uh, the only other thing I'll mention is that I have a personal spiritual discipline that I've practiced for over 50 years, and that's comprised of yoga, meditation, and vegetarianism. Okay, and that actually plays into the novel, so I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that as the conversation progresses. Terrific. Um, so let's talk about the, the book now. Again, it is a novel. It's called Cat's Whisker. Can you give an overview of the story? Yeah, uh, I got the inspiration for this a number of years ago. I, I read an article, and it said that in many parts of our country, the percentage of people who believe in Darwin's theory of evolution is smaller now than it was 50 years ago. And that shocked me. Uh, My first reaction was, well, we we seem to be moving completely in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I, I read more of the article and it became quite clear that the reason most people gave was that evolution and often science in general conflicted with their belief in religion. And I thought, my my first reaction was, how sad Uh, people are missing out on the wonders of science so that they can practice their religion. Uh, But the more I thought about it, and this is especially true here where I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, because so many of my friends identify as agnostic or atheist, So they have absolutely no spiritual component in in their lives, none. And Mm -hmm. I I thought, aren't they missing out on something equally important? I mean, every society on record is sought to create a connection with the spiritual aspect of the cosmos. So many of the people I know are missing that. And that's a huge thing to miss. So I decided to write a novel, Cat's Whisker, I write novels to begin with, so that's the way I generally express myself. And I thought this this would be a book about a character who wants both science and spirituality in his life. Uh, but more than that, not just to have science and spirituality kind of peacefully or tenuously coexist, but to create a mindset where the two merge and actually work together to form a gestalt that's that's greater than the sum of its parts. And, and that's what I tried to do in, in the novel Cat's Whisker. Yeah, and that's something that, that my, one of my first impressions was that exact thing. I think so many people I talk to feel often that science and religion can be mutually exclusive. Um, and, and so it's, it's really interesting that you chose to write this novel and, and, and address just that, that they don't have to be mutually exclusive, but what does that look like? Exactly. And, uh, you know, and it's, it's funny. 
the uh, the pandemic has not done much um, much good or much in the way of positive things for for most people, including myself. But it actually helped Cat's Whisker get published. I think uh, I had had Cat's Whisker lying around for two or three years trying to find a publisher, and nobody really thought that this theme of science and spirituality was resonant sufficiently to uh, pick it up. Uh, as soon as the pandemic hit and we started getting this anti-science um, uh, reaction from many people being anti-mask and anti-vaccine, uh, and uh, it, it became part of the discussion, part of the zeitgeist, uh, suddenly this, this novel became appealing to um to some publishers. Uh, so uh, I, I think that what you said about the, the conflict between science and spir spirituality is even more acute right now uh, because of recent events. Mm -hmm. And so the novel reads, um, it's written in the first person, it's told by the, the main character, uh, whose name is Samuel Barron. It reads in a lot of ways, it feels like a memoir, like you're reading a memoir. Did you... Oh, was, did you set out to write it in that style or did that kind of develop as you wrote? Yeah, I tried to get into the head of Samuel Barron and how he would recount his story and his life. Uh, and in, in some ways, he's a very spiritual individual. In other ways, he's trained uh, in a very exacting manner as, as a, a scientist and engineer. Uh, so uh, it, it seemed to me that this is the way he would tell his story. All right. Now that you know a little bit more about Cat's Whisker and about Baron as the main character, Samuel Baron as the main character, let's go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. When we come back, Robert will be talking a little bit more about Samuel and what about him might resonate with readers. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Golden State Media Concepts bring you the Bible Study Podcast. Reflect and journey the Bible as together we study God's Word and be inspired. Bible study made fun and informative for all ages. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast. Robert Stephen Goldstein about his novel *Cat's Whisker*. Let's go ahead and return it to that interview. Yeah, and so can you talk a little bit more about Samuel as that main character and that story? What do you think will resonate with readers about Samuel and his story? Yeah, uh, Samuel Barron. Yes, he's for me. He was a very interesting character to write about. Uh, as I mentioned by trade, he's a scientist and engineer, and he's also a successful businessman. Uh, but the thing is with him, he wants both aspects. He wants both very badly. He wants to live a material life to enjoy uh, the pleasures of the flesh, to be successful. But he also, and this is a yearning in him from the time he's a young boy, he's drawn very, very powerfully to the spiritual side, the mystical aspect of the universe. And I think there are many people in our world today who would like to have a, a strong spiritual path that fits with our modern lifestyle and with the advances of science. Uh, so I think that uh, those people would identify uh, with, with Sammy, and uh, that's, that's really what the book is about. Um, slightly off subject, but I, I was wondering, so the... The, the very first chapter talks about Sapphire, and, we, and Sapphire comes up more. Um, the book is also dedicated to Sapphire. So is Sapphire based on an actual dog? 
Yes, Sapphire is based on a dog. She she actually um, passed away while I was writing Cat's Whisker. Oh, I'm sorry. And she was 18, uh, and or she was almost 18. So she had lived a, a long life. And I, um, I wanted her to live on those pages. So um, I, every other novel I've written, I've dedicated to my wife. And I actually <laughs> asked my wife's permission if I could dedicate this one to Sapphire. And my, my wife had read uh, early versions, uh, early drafts. And she said, you, you have to dedicate it to Sapphire. That's the only appropriate thing to do. No, oh, I love that. Well, and I, I don't know, I think it's just so appropriate because um, uh, just our relationship with animals sometimes can really lend itself to our concept of spirituality. Um, so very much so they they don't have the intellect blocking their uh, pathway, do they? Yes, yes. Um, in terms of research, did you do any particular types of research for the book, whether on the science side or the spiritual side? Uh, most of my research, I, I, I did I, I did a bit on each, but most of my research for Cat's Whisker was in matters scientific. Uh, things like ev- evolution, uh, the Neanderthal tribes of uh, early humans, uh, plant neurobiology, birds and dinosaurs. And, and you know, Sarah, what, when you really immerse yourself in that sort of thing, the wonders of science can seem to you to be every bit as moving and seemingly miraculous as uh, the stories in the Bible. Uh, But I don't, and um, just to go off on a slight tangent here, I don't, and and Sammy doesn't either. Uh, I don't want to downplay the importance of Bible stories in our culture. I think they're central to who we are and how we see ourselves in the world. At their heart, I think they set up the duality that all of us, in a sense, live with, um, that while there's an aspect of the cosmos that we can measure and test and predict and subject to scientific and mathematical laws, there appears to be another part, a, a mystical, spiritual a- aspect of the cosmos, uh, a non-rational aspect, if you will. And that aspect has always been better explored through stories, uh, fiction, poems, art in general, music, uh, so in this book, I, I'm trying to use literature to examine both of those aspects. And, and the, uh, the research helped me do that. So in terms of that, from examining this relationship with science and spirituality, what do you hope readers might take away from the book? Well, first and foremost, I hope readers enjoy the book. That, that's really the primary duty of a writer, I think, uh, to supply a book that's engrossing and keeps the reader's interest. Uh, personally, I work very hard on that aspect in Cat's Whisker because I realize that at heart, it's a, very, it's a heavily thematic book. It, it's delving into, uh, into things intellectual and... Um, I wanted readers to find the book enjoyable enough to stay with it. Uh, readers are not going to get anything out of your book if if they if they uh, can't stick with it and they just toss it aside. So uh, I, I worked hard on that. Um, so I, I'm hoping that for readers the this whole this whole exploration of the the apparent conflict between spirituality and science uh, can be explored in a way that's engaging and fun. And if I succeed at that, maybe maybe it will give people a a few clues for their own path in terms of uh, reconciling those into into a gestalt that that really works for them and, and combines the two in a, um, in a seamless and, and powerful way. And how about um, characters when you're writing? And so this is from Samuel's 
point of view. And I know you said you really wanted to get into his mindset, but um, did you have a really good picture of Samuel before you started writing? Did he develop more as you wrote? Um, how does that usually work for you in terms of character development? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, I, I think all writers approach these things quite differently. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I personally go in with a few characters who are pretty firmly set in my mind, although they, they certainly grow and take on their own life uh, as I write. But I go in with just the barest high-level outline of the story, a few high points I want to hit, and I just start writing. And my best ideas always come while I'm actually writing. Uh, so um, a lot of Cat's Whisker took shape as I wrote it. And Sarah, you've probably heard other writers say this to you, but it, it's really true. And this happened a great deal during Cat's Whisker. Uh, characters appear and uh, who, whom you may not have expected to appear. And, uh, and they, uh, <laughs> and they do things and say things that um, it's almost as if you, you hadn't planned that, but they've taken on a life of their own. So um, some aspect of, of the subconscious, I think, in a writer's mind is working when, when that happens. And um, conscious um, volitional control over your characters kind of seeds a bit to um, other forces, intuitive forces uh, within you, I think. And see, I love that because as you talked about that, I was thinking, you know, uh, yes, a lot of authors have said that very same thing. But um, when you're writing a book that talks about science and spirituality, I feel like this is so apropos because I'm sure there's a scientific reason for why characters do things while you're writing, you know, something to do with your subconscious and that coming out. But it's also very spiritual, like uh, you have this set path, but something else nudges you in a slightly different direction on that path. Um uh, it just yes. occurred. I don't know. I'm, I'm not making a lot of sense, but I just thought it was really interesting that those kind of combine in character development. No, I, I agree completely with that. And, uh, you know, we have connections with parts of ourselves and with others that are inexplicable uh, scientifically. It, it, it's, it, it's always somewhat amusing to me when I read that, um, you know, scientists have done, um, numerous experiments trying to either prove or disprove the existence of ESP, um, clairvoyance and uh, that, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I don't think that that's part of the measurable uh, or scientifically explorable aspect of the cosmos that's existing on this um, kind of non-rational spiritual or mystical uh, plane that, that you just referenced. And, uh, so, uh, so, so repeatable kind of experiments are not going to work with that. I know if I look in my own life, I've had some very powerful experiences of, um, of knowing the exact moment that, that somebody passed away, for instance, even though they were thousands of miles away and, and I had no idea that they were about to pass away. Now, you can't, that, that's not the kind of experiment you can duplicate uh, in a laboratory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. You know, it, it's surrounded by so much emotion and, and passion and, and kind of love and power. And uh, so, yeah, I, I agree with you that it's, it's happening on, on a plane that is not necessarily measurable or, or understandable. Yeah, it's um, it's definitely a conversation that could go on for much longer than probably the length of the podcast would allow. But something to something to think about. As you ponder that, we are going to take our second break of the podcast. When we come back, more from Robert about Cat's Whisker. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. 
Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. about his novel, Cat's Whisper, Whisker, excuse me. Let's go ahead and return to the interview with Robert. In terms of, again, Samuel as the main character and maybe other characters or storyline, I, I know that just from what you mentioned in, when you were talking about yourself a little bit, you know, you grew up um, on the East Coast, moved to San Francisco. You've had a spiritual journey as well. Um, so are there, are there a lot of parts of you in Samuel or just kind of a little bits here and there how does that work in terms of autobiographical autobiographical elements when you're writing <laughs> it's it's a very funny thing people who know me some of them will say to me oh this is an autobiographical novel samuel Barron is is just like you and then other people who know me say how did you come up with this guy he's nothing like you oh funny uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that uh, there are certainly some aspects uh, of me in, in Samuel Barron, and there are some aspects of other people I've known, uh, but he, he is not I. Uh, we're, we're quite different in many ways. Uh, but, um, and, and certainly, although our, spirit, our uh, mutual spiritual journeys may have been somewhat similar in a in kind of a grand overview, they they were quite different in terms of the timeline and the accompanying um, uh, real life incidents and uh, 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 things that that uh, he delved into versus I delved into. He 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 was a practitioner of um, the martial arts for a great deal of his life. Um, that's not something I've ever done. I've practiced yoga for most of my life, which is quite different. Uh, but they're they're both um, they're both practices that that can have a very strong spiritual component if they're pursued in that way. Yes, through movement and those sorts of things, just different kinds of movement. Um, you have this is not your first. Uh, novel. So um, are there any other novels that you want to highlight during uh, this time or anything that you're working on now that you want to talk about? I have a novel coming out in June okay. uh, called Will's Surreal Period. It's quite different from Cat's Whisker in that it's, um, it's a much lighter, funnier, more plot-driven book. Um, it's about the... Um, sometimes humorous and sometimes um, emotionally wrenching machinations of an eccentric and dysfunctional family uh, that's trying to figure out how to mend uh, lots of old wounds. And um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy with the book. It comes out in June, as I said. And uh, you mentioned that uh, Cat's Whisper is in first person and uh Will Surreal Period is my fourth novel, but curiously, it's the first one that I decided to write in third person. And so it was a very uh, interesting book for me to write from that point of view. And I think I, I made that decision because um, unlike, say, Cat's Whisker, which has one very, very strong character, and you see the other characters in the book who are interesting as well, but you, you see them all through Sammy's eyes through Sammy's perception. Um, Will Surreal Period has a kind of ensemble cast of characters. So um, 
different segments are told through the uh, point of view of different characters and you, you get, um, uh, a, it's a different way of telling a story and I, I found it quite interesting as an author to do that. So that's the book I'm working on now. Uh, well, that's the book that's coming out. I am working on a fifth book now, but it's uh, pretty too, too nascent to say much about. Uh, if there's another book that um, I'll just mention, the, the best-selling novel to date that I've written is a book that came out in 2020 called Enemy Queen. And again, quite different from the others that I've written. This one is a sexual comedy of manners, uh, a sex farce, you might say. It's uh, very funny. It's quite wicked um, and um, <laughs> very, very different from uh, Cat's Whisker. So <laughs> well, I, yes. I mean, <laughs> just I'm just um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm laughing just at the at the the broad range of topics from a sex farce to the story of spirituality and science to more of you know exploring through dark humor, d you know, dysfunctional families. <laughs> That's very eclectic. Um, I like it. Well, you know, I like it too. Uh, the the publicists or marketers that I work with don't especially love no, it. No, they don't like and it when it, you don't fit into one box all the time. <laughs> yes, you don't fit into one box. And Robert, you're not creating a brand. Right. And, <laughs> well, well, you know, um, I'm not in any way comparing myself to Shakespeare. But if you look back, Shakespeare wrote um, madcap silly comedies. He mm -hmm. wrote... Uh, uh, tragedies where, you know, dead bodies are strewn about the stage. He wrote histories. He wrote beautiful sonnets. Yep. Uh, I don't remember anybody complaining that um, his brand was muddled or confused. <laughs> Those are the lost manuscripts or the lost, the lost communications between Shakespeare and <laughs> whoever was promoting him. <laughs> right, between Shakespeare and his publicist. Yes. Uh. <laughs> um. Back to writing in first person and third person, since you'd only written, uh, since you'd been writing in first person up till this point, was it, was it hard for you to shift or did it come pretty naturally because of the nature of the story you were writing? Well, I, I've written in third person. I just haven't written, written a novel. Oh, okay. Third person. I've written uh, short stories in third person. Uh, so the, the, the shift was, was not that, that difficult. And, and I think in, in the case of the, the, un, the, the ensemble cast, the, the very nature of that novel lent itself to telling different segments through the eyes of different people. Because, um, you know, if you tell a story in first person, you can get very, very deeply into the, the thinking of that character. But you can only talk about what that character sees and knows and is aware of. So if things are happening somewhere else that will eventually come into the story, you, you really can't talk about that if you're writing strictly in first person. Uh, in Will's Surreal Period, I had a story where part of the family is on the East Coast, part is on the West Coast. Uh, they're moving around and uh, in some cases um, converging up upon each other. So things are happening in, in one area that, that other people know nothing about. So just to tell the story effectively and amusingly, you, um, you jump around and, and you're telling what, what's happening. And I think it's, it's kind of interesting for the reader uh, to know all these little things that are happening that that no no single character in the book is aware of, but it's all going to come together and either mesh or explode at some point. <laughs> and uh, you, as a reader, are aware of that, and you can make your own guesses and anticipate how how it may turn out. But uh, none of the characters in the book are quite aware of that. Mm -hmm. Which is always interesting because you're like it, it, that's when we when that's when we as readers start yelling at at characters <laughs> because we know more than they do. Yeah. I'm not the only one that does that, right? I'm not the only one that yells at the characters in my book. Maybe not even out loud. Sometimes out loud, but like it's frustrating when you are reading a book and you know what's going on, but the characters don't know what's going on. And you just want to say stop it or do this or why are you being so dumb? Uh, I can't be the only one. No, I know I'm not the only one. 
Anyway, um, time for our final break of the podcast. When we come back, more with Robert. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. Together we dive into the world of sci-fi and science fiction. From episodes of Star Trek, Star Wars, to The Walking Dead, Resident Evil, all the hot new science fiction movies from the back doors of Marvel or DC. The Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. You'll never look at science fiction the same way again. You mentioned that you you retired a little early in life and you started writing, but had you been writing before that? Had you wanted to write before that? How did that work for you in terms of deciding to write for publication? Uh, yes, Sarah, I've always wanted to write. Uh, I, I learned to read when I was only three years old. And um, amazingly, I, I just started writing stories pretty much immediately after that. Uh, I, when I was seven, I remember I had a poem published in my elementary school newspaper. And then uh, when I was a senior in high school, I wrote a short story uh, called Fumatorium. And it won first prize in the Scholastic Magazine's National Short Story Contest. Uh, so then I went to college and I majored in English literature and creative writing I even published a couple of articles in trade journals while I was in college. Uh, but at that point, it's, it, it's, uh, once I graduated, it seemed that I really had a decision to make. And it, it just seemed to me when I really looked inside myself that I, I wasn't ready. And, and I knew it. I hadn't lived. I didn't have the confidence, the maturity, the self-discipline, or especially the wisdom uh, the life experience and wisdom that, that I knew I needed to write the kind of books that I wanted to write. So I started working and I made a pact with myself that I'd, um, I'd work hard, I'd live frugally, I'd invest wisely, and I'd retire as early as I can and write novels without worrying how many copies they sold. I could write what was really in my heart and what I wanted to express. Um, Anytime I shared this strategy uh, with anybody, uh, pretty much everyone I knew told me that uh, it was a lousy strategy and it would never work. Uh, <laughs> they all said I'd never save enough money to do it, but even if I did, that I, I surely would have lost the internal fire to write by the time I was that old. Uh, but as, as you mentioned, and as I said earlier, I did retire at age 56. Uh, and, I, and I suppose by some people's standards, I'm old now. I'm, I'm 70. Uh, and I haven't lost that fire yet. I'm working on my fifth novel. So I suppose in, retros in retrospect, the strategy that I chose worked for me. I'm not necessarily saying that it's a strategy that I rec <laughs> recommend to other people. Uh, I am by nature a very patient, tenacious person who sticks to a plan. Um, uh, I don't know many people who necessarily share those traits, but this, this strategy worked for me, and I'm, I'm really happy now. I'm, I'm writing. I'm living the life of a writer, but I, um, I took the time before, before retiring to make sure that uh, I could live okay without making money off the books, uh, mm -hmm. off, off the novels. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm by no means wealthy, but I, I'm, you know, my wife and I are comfortable. We, we have a, a nice home in San Francisco. We have a beautiful dog and uh, we're, we're happy people. It's not very spiritual, but do you ever just want to say, see, I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
um, from your own experience then, and maybe it's not to try to invest wisely and retire earlier, but um, what advice would you give to aspiring authors? I'd say if you love it, do it. You have to do it. You have to find a way to do it that works for you. The, the one thing I would caution is, uh, please don't expect to make a living from it because almost nobody does. Uh, you can, you know, you can look at some of the best writers out there who are writing literary fiction now, people whose names you've re- you recognize, people who've won prestigious awards. And if you, um, if you look into uh, their lifestyles, pretty much every one of them is making a living doing something other than writing fiction. Most of them are professors teaching English or creative writing. I know one or two own uh, own bookstores. Some are journalists. But, you know, aside from Stephen King and Danielle Steele uh, and people like that, there are really very, very few people who earn a living writing novels. So if you're realistic about that aspect of it and you find a way that works for you, I think it makes the whole endeavor more feasible and approachable. But as I said, if you love it, you have to do it. So please do it. Mm-hmm. I, I noticed that in the, of the people I've interviewed, um, journalists and lawyers seem to be the top two other careers that people uh, huh. have either while they're writing or before they write. Yeah, a great many um, attorneys go on to write kind of uh, courtroom uh, thrillers, and don't they? Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Uh, when you take the time to read for yourself, then, um, who are your authors and genres that you tend to turn to? Uh, I read some new stuff. I try to keep up, but I, I, I read a lot of older stuff. Uh, I'd say that the writers who have influenced me the most have been, uh, let's see, uh, John Steinbeck, Herman Hesse, Charles Dickens, John Irving, Oh, and a fellow almost nobody remembers now uh, named Jerzy Kozinski, who wrote some amazing stuff back in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, Does that name ring a bell with you? I want to say slightly, but I couldn't tell you anything about that that author. Yeah, almost nobody remembers him anymore. Uh, He wrote uh, Steps, Painted Bird, Being There. Um, Quite... uh, I would love to see what what he was writing now, but sadly, he um, he ended his own life when he was fifty seven years old. So mm. we won't know that. But uh, yeah, those yeah. those people. I read more old fiction uh, than new fiction. I, I suppose um, you know when when you are a um, an active writer, you get to know other writers, mm-hmm. and so you read each other's books. Uh, yeah. So I, I read. Uh, books by many people that um, uh, the people listening probably have not heard of because we're, you know, we're, we're authors who publish uh, with independent presses and uh, we're, we support each other. And uh, it's, it's um, you read some pretty interesting stuff that way too. Oh, I agree. I mean, I've, I've, through this podcast, I've read books that I would never have come across otherwise. So it's, yeah, I'm it's, sure it's you're, nice. you're in almost exactly that, that same position. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes I'm on social media and there's the books that everyone is talking about, everyone's promoting. And I'm like, yes, but <laughs> there's, there's so much more out there. Um, in terms of Internet and social media, I, uh, I believe you have a website. So if you can share your website as well as any social media platforms where people might be able to interact with you. Yeah. Um, if you Google Robert Stephen Goldstein, you should find me. Uh, if you Google Robert Stephen Goldstein author, you will definitely find me. My author website is robertstephengoldstein.com. Uh, from there, you can link uh, to any books you might be interested in purchasing. Uh, I have a, an author page on Facebook. Um, I'm on LinkedIn a bit. I'm not um, huge on uh, social media beyond that. Uh, another another thing my publicists are not thrilled about. <laughs> I'm um, sure not. Um, but uh, Robert Stephen Goldstein, Stephen is with a V, yep. and Goldstein is E-I-N. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. Yep. And um, I think yesterday I, when I Googled you, I accidentally did Stephen with a PH, but I still found you. So, Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Um, I, I, I did not, I did not pre look at your name before I typed it into the search engine. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I don't know why there are many people who just um, think of me as a PH Stephen. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if, if that signifies that they find me articulate or something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, um, I, I hope it's that they don't find me intimidating or, <laughs> or, or, or arrogant, but uh, I, I don't know why, but that's the first, um, that's the first assumption many people make. Uh, well, and I don't not, even know why. I mean, I don't usually type Stephen with a PH, so maybe I was just in a strange place yesterday for myself. <laughs> I don't know. In any <laughs> event, it's, it's not the direction my parents took. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, well, Robert, I, um, we've talked about quite a few different things today during our time together, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you would like to bring up or highlight at this time? Let's see. Uh, oh, you know, Sarah, there is one, one little um, interesting tidbit I'd like to share about Cat's Whisker. Uh, people often ask me, what on earth do the whiskers of a cat have to do with your novel? Uh, yes, so good um, point. I, I, I just like to clarify that the reference in the title has absolutely nothing to do with house cats. A Cat's Whisker detector, which is often just called a Cat's Whisker, was actually the original semiconductor long before we had vacuum tubes or transistors or even crystal diodes. We had these things called cat's whiskers. Uh, They looked like uh, kind of very long phonograph needles that scratched at the surface of a piece of semiconducting mineral, uh, often galena. Uh, Anyway, I chose that as the title to the book Um, Kind of in a nod to Herman Hesse and his great spiritual novel, uh, Steppenwolf. In the novel Steppenwolf, uh, the main character loves classical music and finds it very spiritual. And that character is able to sense the spirituality inherent in the music, even when he listens to it on scratchy old phonograph records. So similarly, in my book, um, Sammy builds a cat's whisker uh, radio set when he's a kid. It's a very meaningful project for him. It plucks radio waves out of the air and he's built it with with just things he he found in his own kitchen. And later when Sammy's an old man, he kind of likens that cat's whisker to his daily meditation sessions where he's trying in a way to sort of pluck spirituality out of the mystical aspect of the cosmos as as if he's a human cat's whisker. So, uh, so that is the, uh, <laughs> that's why the, the, t- the book's called Cat's Whisker. It plays an important part uh, in the novel. Well, and I, but thank you for, for that. That's, um, that's very helpful. I will just say that at the beginning, when, you know, you were talking about Sapphire, the dog, I was like, now I'm offended on Sapphire's behalf that the book is called Cat's Whisker. <laughs> 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 not, not really, but I was... <laughs> It's good to, it's good to always good to have the back, the backstory for titles. Um, Robert, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today uh, to talk about Cat's Whisker and some of your other writings, uh, spirituality and science. I really, really appreciate your time. Thanks so much, Sarah. It was great talking to you. It's been a real pleasure. I very much appreciate the opportunity. Uh, take care and be well. Thank you. You too. Thank you again to Robert for taking the time to talk to me about Cat's Whisker and writing and his other novels. Uh, As always, I really appreciate it. I hope that you enjoyed the interview and that you'll maybe check out Cat's Whisker if you're interested especially in science and spirituality, either one or the other or both, and just see what you think of the main character's journey through both of those subjects. I also hope that you will join me next time when I am welcoming author Katia to Canna Mason to talk about her memoir, A House of Music, Raising the Canna Masons, 
They are a remarkable family, seven children, all classically trained musicians. And you're going to have to tune in next time to find out more about that, but a, a really remarkable family. And so join me for that conversation with Caddy on the next episode. In the meantime, if you are a fan of this podcast, please, uh, as always, like, follow, subscribe, do all those things that will get you new episodes when they come out. Leave a review if you haven't done so already. It really helps us to get this podcast out to more listeners such as yourselves. That review can be written or starred, but anything helps. And also follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Love hearing from listeners, so hit me up on social media and let me know what you're thinking these days, what you're reading these days, what's going on in your life. Hope you're having a great week. Hope that your week continues to go well, or if it hasn't gone great so far, that it gets better. And maybe even if it doesn't get better, I hope it does, but um, regardless, if it's great, if it's not going well, if it needs to get better, if it does get better, whatever's going on in your life, I really hope that you can find time to, you know, take a mental health break and get yourself lost in a really good book. Talk to you next time. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.